All right, thank you. We're talking about uh, teaching teenagers today, and I'm telling you, it's one of the greatest challenges you ever face in church. You know that. Many of you were just a teenager. <laughs> you're glad you're out of that finally, but you were there, and um, some good things, some bad things happen along the way, but uh, it, it's going to require trained teachers and workers in your church. Somebody's got to work with them. Uh, somebody's got to deal with them. Somebody's got to know who they are and where they are in this day and time. Um, so in the first paragraph there, uh, these, these kids are moving headlong into some of the most critical decision-filled times of their life. And here's the, here's the key, though. You are there for them. That's who you are, and that's what you do. You are there for them. And so you have got to know who you're talking to, not only in general sense about teenagers of today, but specifically about Mary and Sam and so on. Um, so here's some thoughts about teaching teenagers. Are you believable? Are you believable? As the teen hears you, sees you, and watches your mannerisms, are you to be believed? I've seen some that I wouldn't, you know, I couldn't wait till the class was over because I, I knew he didn't even believe what he was saying to start with. Are you believable? Are you talking their world? As you prepare your story or illustration, keep comparing it to the world of teenagers. Talk to your students as if they're going into the real world on Monday through Saturday because they are. And it is totally different than your Sunday world. Totally different. And some of your kids will face things that other teens won't face because the difference in a Christian life and sometimes even the difference in a, a, uh, a great Christian home and a nominal Christian home. Because the teenager is going to grow up in a nominal Christian home and the one they have in all probability will be less than that. Because that's the progression. When you start down that road, then you just keep on going in most cases. So are you talking their world? Number one, choosing the best from all the rest. I'm talking about curriculum here. Most churches use some type of planned curriculum. Some use none. I found some who just say, well, we just teach the Bible. And so they buy no curriculum whatsoever. I mean, one of the greatest things that happens in a local church is the curriculum that's taught to whatever age group you're dealing with. The scope and sequence. In some churches, nobody knows what that is. They never heard of it. And other places, they just, you know, they're supposed to come up with a lesson by themselves, and they, and they're, they're, you wouldn't want that teacher in your church, but they teach anyway, and they're supposed to come up with their own lesson, and they've never been taught how to study their own Bible, never. See, I've traveled for 38 years now trying to teach teachers how to teach, and that's what I'm concentrating on the last years of my life, is that right there? We brought up master clubs and all that, but that's that's fine and going. We're almost over, I think, right at 600 churches now. But uh, I've turned my attention toward teaching. And I guarantee I'll be in Tucson this weekend, and I guarantee we're going to have 10 churches there. And I guarantee you eight of them have never had training of any kind whatsoever in 30 years. Zero. Zilch. Goose egg. Nothing. Out of churches just like yours and mine. Nobody's taught those people anything. And so, yet they're supposed to be able to understand what to come up with from the Bible, much less put a lesson together, much less, less teach it where it would. So, anyway, I got issues. <laughs> all right, number one, choosing the best from all the rest. That's what we're talking about here. Uh, scan. Now, here's your, here's your notes. Whatever becomes your lot is usually more material than you need. There is a best out of all the rest. One of the biggest problems in teaching any age group today is a teacher comes to class with too much stuff. Too much stuff. We got too many notes. We got too many pages over here uh, because it's going to take all of our time doing that. There's not going to be any interactive learning uh, going on, and that's how people learn best. People have learning preferences. We're going to look at that a little bit later. And if I'm not touching where they learn best, they missed it. And sometimes I didn't even know they missed it because I, I never read a book like that. I don't read. Uh, so <laughs> whatever becomes your lot, though, that's what you've got. Scan the complete notes quickly. Look at your notes now. I, I, I'm, I'm going to read some of these because I wrote it out. I want you to take it home with you. Next, scan it again. Just scan it over. Compare the sections of content with the students you have in mind. Ask the Spirit of God to impress you as you scan the content. You may have a lesson that is mainly designed for adults, 
but our church use it for all ages. So you have to make sure that you know who you're talking to. Ask the Spirit of God to impress you as you scan the content. See, he knows. Listen, the Spirit of God knows who's going to be in your classroom next week. He knows in this empty seat right here, there's going to be somebody here that's never been here before. The Spirit of God already knows that. I, I've never seen the guy in my, in my life. And uh, so he's a teenager coming in here. Maybe it's his first time in church. The Spirit of God already knows that. The Spirit of God knows what I'm going to teach next week. And if I will start early in the week and give him time to work on me, he will impress something in that lesson that is zeroing in on this kid's life. It may be something that just happened to this kid last week. It may be something that's going to happen next week to this kid right here. And he'll do that with all of your students there. He'll give you stuff. If you'll, if you'll start early enough, most of us wait to the, uh, you know, Saturday and try to cram it in. It's like cramming for a test. And here we're the teacher. We try to cram it all in and get there tomorrow, and, and then we got seven pages of notes, and we can't, can't be free of those notes. We can't be out there where they are and express ourselves and all that. Anyway, it's a problem. All right, so whatever your lot is, you can work that out. Ask the Spirit of God to impress you as you scan the content. He knows who you have. He is the teacher of all teachers. Now, that's a big role for you to do. To be a teacher worth listening to is a great big role to play for God. And you're the only one in the classroom that can make that happen. You're the only one there that God has to teach those, those kids. Be careful with words and terms down at the bottom. I, I tell this a lot to children's workers, but, man, teenage workers are the same, and even adults, some of them can't understand. They've been in church 10 years, and, and you ask them to stand up and explain condemnation or omniscient. Don't ever ask them on the spot to do that. Give old Fred over here about six weeks to go home and work on that and say, Fred, in six weeks I want you to explain to my class what condemnation is. Take about three minutes. <laughs> Maybe he can do it by then. <laughs> Don't ask him on the spot. And teenagers are as bad as all the rest of them. Now, look at, look at down at the bottom. The teacher's role is this. Now, this is good. To so clarify, big letters, to so clarify what God has to say to the student that the student could not possibly miss what God has to say to him. Now, that is your role as a teacher. Whether you teach kids, teenagers, adults, it's your role. You are to so prepare yourself and so pray that you walk in that classroom, open God's Word, and you're there for this reason, to so clarify, to so clarify what God has to say today to the student, that the student couldn't possibly miss what God has to say to him. Now, you talk about a big role to play. Give me some other role in the church that's bigger than that. And you know what? God's going to bring it up again to judgment seat of Christ. He's going to bring up our stewardship to the ministry he gave to us while we walked this earth. And perhaps yours was teaching. If you are a teacher, it's probably the biggest thing you're going to do for God. There's no responsibility like it. When I do our sessions, we go for four hours, and I have uh, something that comes up. It's called the teacher significance o meter. <laughs> I made <it> myself. <laughs> and uh, it's this great big old uh, uh, chart that goes up, up to the wall. You know, I mean, it goes on the overhead uh, pr um, PowerPoint, and it, it goes, whoosh, and it goes up. Whoosh, whoosh, and just all day long, finally reaches the very top because I want, them, I want those teachers to walk out of there seeing how significant you are to God. And you're the only one in the classroom to make that happen. All right, let's go on down to, uh, uh, we're talking about being careful with words and terms. That's what we're doing. All right, now, last paragraph. Stop assuming that students understand about as much as you do. They don't. You must teach yourself to stop along the way to clarify a word or term you just read, but usually have no intention to define or illustrate to your students. Your assumption is that they already know almost everything um, is probably dead wrong. So stop assuming and teach, you see. Uh, we just have to do that. Next page. I'll give you a little example there, and sometime when you have time, you probably take more and just get out here during a break sometime and try to do it, but um, I'll give you a little example there. Uh, the word condemned. We see that a lot. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. Beautiful verse. We all know it. But if I said that to a child, they wouldn't understand it. 
If I said that to a teenager who hasn't been around church and a Christian home very much, they wouldn't understand words like condemned. Uh, they don't know what you just said. And the problem is when I don't know they don't know what I just said, I'm in trouble. Because I'm going to go on, I'm going to leave them in the dust, and they're not going to understand what I say later. See? So I have to stop on some of these words and terms. And, and who am I teaching? Am I teaching 6th graders, 7th, uh, 8th graders, 9th, 10th graders, 11th, 12th graders? Who am I teaching? So I have to be careful. So sometimes when you come back through, just without looking up something previously, just in your own mind, write down, give, give a definition of that, and then add an illustration to it. See how hard it is. With words and terms you use all the time. The John 3 verses you use all the time. Pick out some words in there. I guarantee your teenagers couldn't stand up and tell you what they meant. But you're just going to re reference it as you always do, assuming they understand it as well as you do. You can't do that. You're the teacher. Look at the next one, number three, selecting your one key statement of truth. The average teacher comes to class with too much stuff. We mentioned that. Content on top of content is a major deterrent to learning. Major. The more I have to say, here comes your word now, the more I have to say, the less time I have to clarify any of it. Content, that's your blank, content lingers for a very short time while application lingers long. Content, all the words you come to say, all the notes in front of you, that's content. All the stuff you're just going to talk out, that's content. You have to get to the application. Half of your lesson ought to be application. At least half your lesson. Content does not change lives unless it is wedded with application. Content is the what. That's the what I'm going to give today. Application is the so what. So, what does that mean to me? So, how do I live like that at home, at school? So, tell me that before I walk out your door. And then perhaps I could see it in my life and, and apply it to my life like that. Next paragraph. One statement of truth defined, clearly illustrated, and perhaps even demonstrated stays much longer. So discuss it, brainstorm it, role play it, give a personal illustration, a Bible illustration, a real life scenario, an example from a high school hallway, uh, add a neat story that shows it in real life. Now you've just clarified the truth where the student couldn't possibly miss it. You understand what I'm saying here? Just because you get a nice point, it's not time to say your prayer and go home. I mean, you have to assume that somebody there doesn't understand it at all. And so you're going to have to help them with these things. So next paragraph, in order to teach with one with such clarity, the topic must be narrow enough to allow much focus. You don't assume you plan one key thought and 12 ways or 10 or 8, 12 ways to help your students get it. That's what you do. With, without such effort, you don't have a clue if they're still with you. And listen, your goal is never, never less than to be an excellent teacher for God. You have got to get better than you are right now. Many times we, 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 we think we're better than we are. So teaching is a great big thing, great big deal. Look at the next one. Let me encourage you to make a decision here here's a good quote the achievement of personal excellence is a decision you make or that you fail to make but in the absence of a commitment to excellence in your chosen field you automatically default to average performance or even mediocrity that's from the book no excuses by brian tracy he's one of the top 10 speakers in the world uh, it's all on self-discipline when we decide ahead what our goal is for our age group, then our teaching and even our selection of content weave itself together uh, to hit those teenagers as we should uh, get it across to them. I think one of the things, I don't know what curriculum you use, I think one of the things, if you had somebody in your church who would, instead of asking what curriculum should I use, would perhaps ask, what do I want to teach teenagers? 
What are their needs? What is it they face day by day? What's their direction they're heading in the next two to three years? Uh, then select my curriculum based on what am I trying to accomplish in the lives of a teenager? Not just that I teach this three-year cycle, five-year cycle, but what is it I'm trying to accomplish? Then I look for material that would help me to do that. Down at the bottom there, here's what one-point lessons do. It's the bottom line, take home. One-point lesson, here's what I mean. If you're teaching a lesson on uh, prayer to teenagers, all right, you say, well, I don't know if they're going to get in on this or not. <laughs> We're going to talk about prayer. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows you're supposed to pray, so let's skip that and go to some other subject. But my, le my one sentence, my statement, my one thought I would give is something like this. Uh, you, must, you must pray to have your prayers answered. That's it. That's all I'm trying to teach today. You could have them. Re you, you could you could teach for six weeks on prayer, types of prayer. When and where should we pray? For what should we pray? To whom do we pray? How does God want us to pray? Positions of prayer, attitudes of prayer, panic prayers, all kind of things about prayer. You can read a book that thick on prayer, and never pray. See, that's your problem. It's my problem. You have not because you ask not. Just one verse. <laughs> that's enough. Cut it off right there. You got me. But if that was my lesson, then I'm going to get there within five minutes when I start, and I'm going to stay there the whole time. That's all I'm going to talk about. So when my teenagers walk out the door, if, they, if one of them walk square into a brick wall, uh, the only thing I'd like to hear him say is, yeah, I, I must pray to have my prayers answered. <laughs> well, great. I got it across. <laughs> got it across. Uh, so that's what I'm talking about with uh, one point type thing here. Um, so it is the bottom line, take home, remember, point of all points. Now I can illustrate the same one point three to four times to better touch each student whose lives are surrounded by different circumstances, and they are. Number three, the repetition fixes the one key principle in the mind of each. Every illustration or discussion or role play or personal testimony will enhance understanding. Your students can now write down the one point. They can see it, say it, read it, maybe 10 to 12 times before your class ends. Now, put in the blank here. More to remember equals what? What was it? More to remember equals less to remember, less remembered. We know that. We already know that. And we still come to class with tons and tons of stuff. That's a problem. So I want to shed some of that. I want to pick out, and whatever comes in front of me, I want to pick out a little bit of this. Oh, that'll help my kids right there. I scan over a little bit. Oh, yeah, that, that'll be good right there. And I scan a little bit more and say, hmm, yeah, I like this right here, right down at the bottom. I like that. So I pick this out, this out, and this out, and I skim the rest of it aside without remorse. See, in most curriculums, uh, there are, a lot of peripheral stuff, especially in quarterlies you buy from a company. Nothing wrong with that. A quarterly is a, a good, it's an aid, it's a tool, it's a guide, it's a help, it's all that. But sometimes there's peripheral stuff in there. And it's not bad. You're not going to look at something like that and say, ooh, look at that. Who put that in there? Well, I'd never tell anybody that. You're not going to see stuff like that. But it's just peripheral. It will get you to the point, but it'll take you 25 minutes to get there. And then you wound up with 15 minutes left to say what you really came in to say. So you, you've got to use your mind. You've got to discipline yourself, and you've got to get rid of some of that uh, total amount of content so you can have more time to focus in on the key things that you want to do. All right, moving right along here now. <laughs> Number four, putting purpose in every lesson. Every teacher must teach with the end result in mind. See, you've got to, you've got to make that decision. If you make it early on, it'll help you to both choose and discard from the total amount of content at your disposal. Now look at the next paragraph. In the book, Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. John Maxwell wrote that one. It's one of his latest. It's one of the best I think he's ever written. He's probably written 60 more books. A lot of them are business-type things. But this is good. Uh, the book is entitled, Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. Communication, to me, means what actually came across. Not all the words that were said, 
not everything I received, but what really stuck. What did I walk home with and I still remember? Communication, connecting. It's a good book. We read this. He says this. What do I want them to know and what do I want them to do? If I have a clear answer to those two questions, then I am much more likely to stay on track, get to the point, and connect with my listeners, end quote. So the question is, when do I answer those two questions as I cover my lesson? In other words, so what? What is the value of 40 minutes of content without a good answer to those questions? Now, we're going to get into some tough things to hear here in a few minutes, but you got to hear them. You need to hear them when you're young. I'm trying, I'm trying to feed this stuff to teacher, teachers who have been teaching for 35 years. You know, and they're hard, hard to change. <laughs> They've never seen anybody's life change because of their teaching. But the problem was they didn't allow it to happen in their classroom. They had so much stuff, they went right to the last moment, said we all ought to live like that, and we all walk out the door. Hopefully, someday, if I get around to it, I'll live like that. Uh, God can do, God can save people right in your classroom. God can change your life right in your classroom before the bell rings. So when do I answer those questions in my, in my material? See, it all seems irrelevant without purpose. What's the purpose? What's the destination? Where are you going with this lesson? Why are you teaching this thing? Do they need, is it, does it touch their needs? If not, when do I touch their needs? You got to be careful with all of these things as, as you become a teacher for God. It's a great thing. Putting order, number five, putting order in every lesson. Step one is to scan the content with one key truth in mind. One key truth. The time to eliminate the peripheral matters is early on if you can. All right? So this brings us, uh, no, let's go to the last paragraph. Next, think through any signs that have waved a red flag in the lives of your present-day students. Examples out of the recent news, especially local, are good. In, uh, in other words, you're trying to grab the attention of the student in that first four to five minutes of class. We, we, we talk about that as the learning process. Uh, to know, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there I'm going to give them the gist of what the Lord's going to teach us. We're going to read the passage together hopefully, all together, and then I'm going to give them a key state. I'm going to give them a, what if this happened to you? I'm going to do something to grab their attention to cause them to want to listen to what is being said. That is my role as a teacher. It's not the student's role. It's not your role to blame the student that they're not listening. It is your role to try to create a reason for them to listen. You have got to do that. You can't blame students the rest of your life. You've got to improve yourself and get better at yourself, get better at it. All right, so down putting, uh, step one is to scan the content with the one key truth in mind. All right, um, okay, let's, let's go on. I'm not going to explain the learning process I did last hour. <laughs> uh, we did last year, I think. Okay, next page. Now, this page will really help you here. We only got uh, 10 minutes left here. Students have different styles or learning preferences. Listen, I guarantee you I've talked to at least, at least, 150 teachers this year, oh, probably more than that, this year, this year alone, who have never heard stuff like this on this page, never heard it in their life because nobody ever taught them. They don't read books. They don't do anything. They just, they just teach the way they've taught for the last 20 years. And nobody in that church has had enough initiative to uh, stick a book under their nose and say, read this thing. Students have different preferences in how they learn best. In other words, do you use visuals? If not, most of your class learns best through a visual. Usually I have all this on PowerPoint. I'm, I'm going from one to another so fast I can't do that. But um, do you use visuals? If not, you ought to, you ought to start finding every, every piece of visual you, you can. Uh, when I go in churches, a lot of times I'll take my pack with me. I've got 160 visuals that I put out on the pews for those people. And some of them won't even go over and look at them. They won't even go over there and look at them. Do you allow a discussion? You can have a one-minute discussion, a two-minute discussion. We're not talking about 10 or 15 minutes of your talking time here because somebody else is going to want us to talk a while. We're not talking about that. You can do a one-minute discussion, and, and yet have everybody thinking and everybody involved and saying a little something. 
Do you allow for interactive learning? Have you ever used brainstorming? Uh, do you ever use a problem solver? Something to see, something to say, something to do, something to write, something to go home with. Do they ever get any of that in your classroom? If not, you have missed an awful lot of the best ways that people learn. If you're not careful, they're going to have to learn the worst way they have for learning because that's the only one you use. So you have to learn methods and techniques and things like this. Uh, do you ever demonstrate anything right in front of them? See, words are powerful, but a demonstration is more powerful. They can see it in action. All right, now this is big. Right in the middle here, this is big. The goal is not necessarily to limit communication to my best my personal best style of speaking, but to their best style of listening. I guarantee you there's hardly a teacher in the country has heard that before. It's all, how did I do? Now, you don't get through with your lesson and say, you know, I think that's about the best I've ever done. What do you all think? <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it, is, it is not it's not my personal best style of speaking, but their best style of listening. So if my best style of speaking is sit down, don't say anything, I'll get real mad, and soon you'll get it, you'll get it, just wait till I'm through. That's what happens week after week in our churches. See, you're going to either teach the way people learn best, or your class is going to continue to just sit there and wait till you're through. And we have learned that from our, our teenage years, all the way up, we have learned to sit there, be nice, and bored stiff at the same time. We just wait till the guy is through. That's why we watch our watch all the time. And you develop all these creative ways of watching your watch. You don't you stretch a little bit, take a glance at the watch, you know, and, and you do different things like that. And you'll, you'll keep your finger right here, and as soon as the guy looks that way, you look down here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you'd see that in students if you watch them. <laughs> All right, here's a research example. Let me prove this thing to you. In research conducted by Nader and Rollins, that's a great firm, they found an alarming statistic about learning preferences. They looked at 1,500, 1,500 adults who had dropped out of school in the eighth grade and found that 99.60% of them were sensing dominant learners. In other words, they were visual and interactive learners Yet their teachers never taught that way. Guess what happened to them? <whistles> They're out of here. And that was just the 1,500 they studied. Lots more. They needed more than just words, you see. Down at the bo bottom, here's a good quote. Uh, author Rick Blackwood said this, We should not ask, is this student smart? Rather, we should ask, how is this student smart? How are my students smart in the classroom? Is the student hearing smart, visually smart, interactively smart? You have them all in your classroom, see. So here's the thing. If our one avenue of communication is only to attract the hearing smart, lecture, total lecture, then we may be in trouble and don't even recognize it. The recent studies done on the lecture method, and you always lecture. I'm not down on lecture. You always lecture. You start by lecture. You move from here to here through lecture. You, you conclude the points through lecture. You conclude your whole lesson through lecture. But if that's all I ever do, it's simply the hardest way to communicate where somebody's going to connect, and especially in the lives of children and teenagers. They've got too many other things to think about. they got the boy-girl thing. They've got the cell phone in their pocket. They can't. They're trying to sneak out without you seeing it. They, they've got all kinds of things. They've got sports on their mind, everything. So um, let me cover one or two pages here, and our time will be gone. Uh, one guy said in the uh, book, you can double your class in two years or less, great book. The number one variable in predicting the growth of a class is the teaching ability of the teacher. I agree. <laughs> Okay, now up at, the, up at the top there, start early in the week in lesson preparation. Waiting till the busy weekend to start your lesson can lead to a shallow lesson. No one's going to teach this lesson effectively but you. You must be ready to master the stories, the techniques, the words and terms, for just a quick glance at your notes is the only clue you need. All you need is just a half sheet of paper when you come to class. 
You don't need seven sheets of notes over here. You need a half page over here where, where I, can, I can stay out here. And um, what I would do, uh, when I get through with one point, all I have to look over there, and there's a reference. Now we all read that together. I'm right back with my students. When we get to the end of that, I look there. It says mailbox. That's all I need. That's my next illustration. I don't need to go back over here and read a paragraph on what I was planning to say when I got to that point. No, I need to get my eyes back on my students because in about three to four seconds, when I take them off, they're gone somewhere else. They're gone here, uh, over here, or <laughs> they're gone. And you're going to have to turn around and win their attention all over again. You do that about 30 times during the, during the Sunday school hour, and you'll wish you knew how to control that. So uh, it's a big deal, big deal. So allow yourself more time, not less. Um, Oh, let me give you this quote right down the middle here where it says, uh, book tip. We've only got about three minutes here. Uh, book tip from the book Seven Laws of the Learner by Bruce Wilkinson. The teacher is the intermediary of the message. That's you. He stands between the Lord and the people. He is the delivery mechanism that the Lord gave to the church. The teacher of God is the living link between the word of God and the people of God. Again, he said, teachers have separated themselves from their students and redefine teaching as what the teacher says rather than what the student learns. They think about teaching as what they do. Their focus is upon themselves. Many teachers cover the material and leave the room thinking they have taught, end quote. George Bernard Shaw said the biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. I mean, we literally lie to ourselves. In the book Encore Effect by Mark Sanborn, he said, To say I don't need to prepare demeans the event and overvalues your skills. Every event in life is worth the time it takes to polish the details. And could we not say even so as we teach the Word of God? See? Um, well, let's see. The way it was back then. Let me, let me just show you the rest of it here. Uh, where it says the way it was back then. Uh, I've given you a whole list there and on the next page. I've given you a big, long paragraph of the ways that Jesus, the things Jesus used to grab attention when he walked this earth. And these are all things out of Bible lands and times and customs. Some of those things would be known by teenagers. Some of them, they, they, wouldn't, they would just sit there and look at you. They wouldn't have the least idea what you just said. So it's a great thing if I can pair up uh, maybe an Old Testament, New Testament illustration with a something that happened two weeks ago at school over here. Woo. Now I've got that same truth in town. In fact, it happened two miles down the road, or it happened in the next town over here. All of a sudden, truth becomes reality, and that's, that's the biggest area right there. Jesus didn't illustrate um, uh, with uh, or give an object lesson about a cell phone or a Facebook or the web or TV sitcoms or anything like that. But guess where teenagers are today? That's where their mind is. And uh, so that page says also the way it is for teenagers today. Just a reminder there. Teach yourself what you need to know down at the bottom. Put it in the bottom there. There's one blank down there. Perceived. The need to understand your students and their perceived world that they live in today should make us seek a similar situation they can relate to. See? Because you'll, you'll give something, and you can, you can read the rest of this. Um, sometimes you give an illustration, or well, you give a parable of the, uh, the Good Samaritan. Well, they've already heard the thing 30 times or more already. They know the end of the story, and you just now begin to think. So you teach a lesson again. Well, at the end of that, the Lord says, Go and do thou likewise. But what does this teenager, especially one that's not been around spiritual words and terms, understand? What does he understand? We're talking about spiritual words and terms and phrases. He has a harder time understanding that. And so uh, when, I, when I talk about that, I've, I've got to, uh, you know, your teenagers are not going to walk on the way to Jericho, a long path down on a vacant uh, road way out in the middle of nowhere where bandits come and steal all you got and all that kind of stuff. They're not going to face that situation next week or the week after. They're not going to be uh, with a donkey on the, on the road to Jericho. So what does that truth mean to them? Oh, I know what it meant to the Good Samaritan. But what does it mean to me today in this day and time I live? 
So, see, their situation could be like that, but that's the problem. They can't relate many times that mine was the same thing. I was, it was like the Good Samaritan, um, but mine was in a different way. So my wife gets on the phone, and, and she'll be talking, and, and some lady will be t- uh, telling her a story, and, and all of a sudden she'll stop. My wife will say, you know, something like that happened to me. Something like that happened to me. And then she'll take off and tell her side of the story. And it goes on and on and on. <laughs> but that's, you've got to connect that, okay? Make it like in the classroom hallway. Make it like between the student and the teacher at, at school. Make it like something happened in the gymnasium. Make it like something would happen when the cheerleaders get together and practice. Make it like something like that that touches their life, you see. So there's nothing wrong with an Old Testament illustration, but many times our students can't relate to that because they've never seen that. They'll never be around that. Uh, they'll, be, they'll be in situations like that, but not that. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to bridge that gap, you see.